welcome back to the latest edition of Web of Weird with myself, David Farrell, and my co-host, Pete Jackson Main. Hey, bro, how are you doing? We're getting through, David. And um, yeah, I mean, I always say, when you ask me that question, I always say, good, good, I'm good. Everything's good. Everything's good. Um, and, it, and it kind of is, but it's not. Um, and as we, we introduced some themes last time, I think we're going to follow up on this time, which is what the hell is happening to everybody out there? Um, because it's not all good for sure. Um, but, it, you know, I guess my take on it is that we just have to watch it. What are we being shown? What am I, What do the challenges mean for me personally? What am I being asked to look at? So same old, same old. Right. Well, yes. Uh, hashtag WTF is happening, uh, I think, is probably the phrase that we're all wondering about at the moment. But of course, yeah. yes, we're great British. We always ask each other, how are we doing? And of course, we're doing very well. Thank you, sir. You know, top hats and spiffy ponies and all of that kind of stuff <laughs> and uh, blah, blah, blah. But uh, uh, of course, you know, um, things are not always so rosy. And I, I guess probably uh, you're a bit like me uh, in the last like couple of months, or particularly the last two months, is that generally I'm feeling great from a spiritual perspective. I generally feel great. I know everything's fine. I know that my life Life is heading in the direction that I wanted to go but in between uh, it's been absolutely unrelentingly painful and challenging uh, uh, up until I would really say the beginning of February but uh, for sure there were some themes that we've been touching on and again our audience will know that we always try to be as careful as we can so that we don't get banned on uh, YouTube um, so we're going to tackle some uh, some interesting topics today as always uh, take a, a neutral pulse on them as best we can and also offer some possible solutions to what, what is becoming quite um, a series of growing problems that I feel like are sneaking up under the radar. And um, where would you like to start today, bro? I know that you've had some challenges yourself the last couple of weeks. So um, yeah. what's what's kind of bugging you the most? What do you need to get? Okay, so what I'm, what, what's bugging me the most or, or challenging me the most or perhaps um, stimulating me the most in some <laughs> ways? Right. And it takes off from our kind of zombie apocalypse piece last time. Right. Um, because behind the zombie apocalypse is something even more disturbing that I'm picking up on, uh, that I'm that I'm seeing. And it is yeah. a massive wave of narcissism sweeping over the country. Yeah. Um, people behaving in truly despicable ways to each other. People uh, you know, pulling the race card on each other when they really don't have to, and it's really so not necessary. People manipulating each other, people causing doubt. I mean, um, you know, uh, a friend of mine who's uh, who's a, a psychotherapist uh, talks about how uh, abusive people, narcissistic people, their whole program is to create doubt in the people that they're targeting, and that mm -hmm. you know, am I a good person? Oh, did I did I do something wrong? Um, or maybe I'm not as good as I think yet think I am you know all of that stuff where they seem to hone in on the bits of you that you haven't claimed maybe you're not your sovereignty is not intact and the way out of this by the way is to reclaim sovereignty is to say actually no you're not coming in my boundaries are strong my boundaries are tight and uh you know I am not shaken by any of this but where you feel shaken and it happens to us all I guess and we're talking about actual encounters here with actual people um is Which is uh, unusual in the modern world right to actually encounter real people yeah. in the 3D physical space right? in the 3D physical <laughs> space exactly <laughs> Yeah. Um, and when you encounter people in that way, um, you know, it's become quite difficult. It also clicks into uh, our previous uh, discussion on woke and the woke culture and the mm -hmm. cancel culture and all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's kind of takes off from there, but but it's becoming a kind of it's becoming it's gaining a kind of shape to me, if I can put it like that, a psychic shape, if you like. Uh -huh. And I think it's it's very low frequency 4D stuff, you know, to use. Yeah parlance with mm -hmm. which we are uh, and our listeners are, listeners are perhaps familiar um, yeah. it's all of the stuff that's in the astral but it's like the dregs of it that have sunk to the very bottom of, of the sort of frequency band and it's like a soup um, and I I think what, one of the things I kind of like about it in a way because um, you know there have been incidents that I've been involved in, in, in having to sort out but one of the things I kind of like about it is that what the response is in me is okay i know that what i've got to do is stay upright stay positive stay focused stay in my power and mm -hmm. all of that is going to go away i'm actually going to burn it out um mm -hmm. and and you know i had this other 
phrase in my head which is um, the one i think i might have come across before all that's left of an asshole after you burn the shit out of it is a divine being so you have to have that kind of that kind of <laughs> e eagle's eye vision yeah, right. <laughs> don't pull any punches yeah. for that one huh? <laughs> yeah and, and and be able to see that this is in fact the, the sort of shit encrusted uh, people have got themselves admired in all of this stuff they cannot see the way out uh, oh. they need help but you know in what way are you really going to help are you going to pull them out by you know and, and end up getting pulled into the quagmire or into the quicksand or are you going to show them that it's possible to be someone else that it's possible to be in your power it's possible to claim your sovereignty that's the kind of example that people actually need to see uh, that's what's going to get them out because it's only their own efforts that's going to do it nobody can rescue anybody in this situation I'm beginning to see that quite clearly as well right. so the best thing we can do for each other is to look after ourselves to tighten our boundaries to strengthen our boundaries um we're going to uh, maybe ho hopefully uh, at the end of this when we go into our plants we're going to be talking a little bit about nettle nettle is my boundary plant and, and you talk about that, I mean, yeah. yeah um you know so uh, call on our allies and and just stay strong Stay strong. Well, look, I mean, you've touched on many things that I know we've talked about endlessly over the last few years because they're things that we've been seeing unfolding for a while, e even before the process of the last two or three years. And, you know, you mentioned our friend Nettle there, who, who is a very fiery uh, being with, you know, very Martian energy. And I think one of his uh, mantras is, uh, you are not welcome in my space unless mm. I say so. You are not welcome in my space unless I say so. And I think that that's, you know, a big part of why Nettle has stepped in for the immersion that we're going to be running over at QPH from March the 1st. And we'll talk a bit more about that towards the end of the show. But I want to loop back to a couple of the, the points that you raised, because this is a very topic, a very difficult topic to even talk about, because by talking about it, we run the risk of invoking those kinds of reactions. Right. Uh, because yes. we're venturing an opinion about something. And apparently yeah. opinions uh, are something that we're not allowed to have these days because they're bordering on uh, offending people. So we've gone from this place where, uh, you know, a back and forth debate. Uh, which is constructive and doesn't necessarily have to involve name calling or lower frequency stuff. We can have a very constructive debate where people disagree about something, but apparently now that's not allowed, uh, particularly in Britain and, and hasn't been for some time. Um, but I dare to say most of the Western world falls into this kind of trap. And, and that is that we, we have to accept if somebody comes out and says something to us um, that somehow, uh, how to say, uh, that we have to accept their inability to receive the, the, the debate. Uh, let me see if I can rephrase that. So uh, if we want to have an opinion about something that somebody doesn't like, because somehow it maybe calls them to task over something or pulls them up when they maybe haven't been doing something that they've agreed to do, or they're in fact doing something completely illegal. And I mean, look at what's going on across the world. We can say that this is a pattern that has been handed to us, Capricorn style, top down to all of us. Hence the reason I think it's coming up now with Pluto at that 29 degree analyzing and reviewing all of this is we've been brought up in a society that basically uh, doesn't allow you to question look at old edward snowden look at the wikileaks these are people that basically you know were, were, were run to ground for daring to question whether the american government was acting treasonously or not as it turns out it looks like that was very very true and yet these people and poor old uh, Bradley Manning now, uh, of course, Chelsea Manning. Uh, I don't know what that uh, that individual went through in, in his process in order to defend uh, free speech and questioning and debating whether the government should behave in the way that they have been. They ended up in Guantanamo Bay, I believe. So, you know, it's not surprising that we've now got this kind of culture going on at street level. You know, and, you know, and, and, and if you dare to question something, you're then either uh, some sort of divisive uh, conspiracy theorist or worse, you're a racist or a sexist or a misogynist or any other number of names that we can be given. And even to talk about this, we, like I say, we run the risk of having stuff thrown at us. But uh, we're just trying to, to break down a pattern, right, that we see emerging. And, and of course, uh, you know, having lived in Britain a, a large part of my life, I know it incredibly, uh, the, the population is incredibly narcissistic. And, and, and then when we look at the government, we, we look at people like our old friend, Mr. Johnson, uh, who, who I would dare to suggest probably has a lot of narcissistic energy uh, going I through think him. He probably does. But I, I want to focus a little bit on the, on the opposite number in this one, because it, okay. I was, as, as you were oh. talking about... Yeah. <laughs> Your favourite. My favourite, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah because, <laughs> you know, um, I was sort of sitting there thinking, you said about, you, you know, uh, the, having the capacity, the intellectual capacity, mm. the honesty to have a debate in which people can disagree but yes. without actually having to destroy or cancel one another. Right. Um, this was something 
I feel quite privileged about in my own education because I was at, I'm actually I will come out and say this is probably going to offend a lot of people but I'm grammar school educated okay oh my gosh bro. I think in, we might get YouTube might pull us for that one I know we might get pulled because <laughs> you know uh, but we you know debate was the essence. I was a member of a debating system I was a very good debater myself I can um, imagine. who would have thought it and uh, and that whole thing was part of the culture now and then I then I suddenly remembered that a few years after me, behind me, was Steer Karma mm. in my school. And how he got to miss out on that, I don't know, because look at what's happening in the Labour Party at I the moment. Know, but yeah. he, is, uh, he is behaving like an out-and-out out fascist. He's basically, if you don't support Keir Starmer, you can leave my party. And, you know, I mean, we all know what he did to Jeremy Corbyn. We all know his links with certain, you know, kind of uh, prominent national factions around the world who are engaged in acts of terrorism against uh, people close by. Um, mm -hmm. And you can't say anything about that one either, uh, because that's basically what, what brought um, Jeremy down. Uh, but that whole thing where he really thinks that people are going to sign up. Um, there is a apparently there there is a rumor that um, Corbyn and and um, what's the, the game John McDonnell mm -hmm. are actually going to start another socialist party in, in this country, wow. and they're going to take about two hundred thousand Labour members with them. Uh, but you know that's mm -hmm. the kind of hopeful side of it in a way. I'm not yeah. saying that I necessarily would trust anything that anybody <laughs> does in the realm, in the realm of politics anymore, because I think no. the real control is so not there anymore. Yeah. You know, it's not in that. It's not even in that arena anymore. It's way way above that um, in terms of the sort of globalist um, picture. But the the good news is that actually um, the rats are deserting oh. the Starmer ship, and I think that that. Uh, you know, alongside all of this and all of the other stuff that go on, going on about that is, um, you know, arguably very scary and very uh, worrying and deeply concerning and all the rest of it, I see also more and more people waking up. I see mm. more and more people saying, actually, no, I, I need an alternative to this bullshit, excuse the expression. I no, need totally, actually to be able to believe in a future that doesn't include the that doesn't include being uh, regulated or ruled or told what to do by these um, criminals. Right. Well, look, you know, I think you've just brought an interesting uh, case to point, actually, really to emphasise what we're just talking about. So poor old uh, Mr. Corbyn, uh, you know, and, and some people like it, some people don't, but it's politics for you. But uh, Mr. Corbyn, every time the Conservative Party uh, hit a rocky patch, which was pretty consistently all the time over the last yes. few years, um, uh, somehow American. suddenly the front page news would be about an anti-Semitic uh, story. And it happened. I, I lost count of how many times it happened. And I was counting at one point. So I'm just like this, this guy that it doesn't matter what he does. He's not anti-Semitic. He hangs out with uh, uh, Labour supporting uh, Jewish people who, who apparently are not part of the Jewish community because they're Labour supporters, I, I yeah. would imagine, is the theory. And because he does that, because he supports uh, the um, Palestinian movement against the aggressions of their neighbours, somehow that makes him anti-Semitic. Uh, and, uh, you know, Poor Mr. Corbyn, in, in in my opinion, never really had the energetic support. Uh, he didn't have the, I would dare to suggest, the medicine men, the, the shamans around him to keep him uh, yeah. uh, not um, under the duress of psychic attacks, from which I think he suffered quite a few, uh, judging from uh, how the guy looked at various points. But this whole piece of like basically saying, well, we're in trouble and we don't want you to question us because we're doing stuff that's really, really bad and we want to point the finger somewhere else. They were consistently pointed at Mr. Corbyn and say that he was anti-Semitic, whether it was relevant to any news or not. And because the, the media, uh, also very narcissistic in nature and under control of narcissistic people, I would always go a uh, whole hog against Corbyn. So meanwhile, whilst the government was uh, up to its eyeballs in, in corruption and God knows what else, even before uh, the last three years, uh, somehow they got away with all of it because of this nasty situation. Well, yeah, yeah, there was a standing joke, wasn't there? You yeah. know, anything bad happens out there in the world and it's Jeremy Corbyn's fault. I mean, because I, he's anti-Semitic. Well, yes, I mean, I remember waking up and I looked out in my window and I was supposed to, tr to be travelling and there was six six inches of snow and Ooh. I took a picture of it and posted it on Facebook and said, look what Jeremy Corbyn's done now. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, like, it's on that really stupid level. But this is another, right. I mean, that sounds ridiculous, but here's right. another feature of it, though, mm. and it's this. It's nobody is taking any responsibility for their own shit. It's always someone else's yeah. fault. Everything that happens to you, to them is someone else's fault. Everything that happens 
uh, in their own lives, you know, the way they feel. You're making me say this to you. You're making me be <laughs> right. aggressive to you, right? Yes. Um, and that complete abdication of personal responsibility is another feature of this. Narcissism yeah. it is not, it's narcissism. And, I, I you know, I, I see that in politics too. It's been going on for a long time, let's face it. You know, party politics, the two-party system particularly, that yeah. when, you know, when 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 a, a speaker for one party or the other, it doesn't matter which, is challenged on an aspect of policy that's not going so well, they will automatically blame the opposition party for the fact <laughs> that they screwed up. Yes. Um, and that seems to be sort of embedded in the way that people, and, and it's almost like, I can see these tendencies in people anyway. It's been going on for a long mm-hmm. time, as I've said, yeah. but they're they're reaching caricature point right. at the moment. Yeah. It's it's beginning to look ridiculous. People are making dicks of themselves. You know what I mean? <laughs> and 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 there's some people who can see that. Yeah. There are some people who can see that, and there's some people who can't. And I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around that. Mm. Well, look, I think, you know, what you've alluded to there really is the main theme of today's show that we were sort of honing in on over the last few days as we were sort of making some prep for this, and that is responsibility. And I've written here in my notes, personal responsibility and spiritual responsibility, and perhaps we'll break those down uh, a little bit more as we go on. But I just want to also bring in some other um, bits and pieces around this. And there's... um, there's a couple of phrases that you used with me earlier that maybe we can bring into the mix. And again, we're trying to be very neutral about this. We are taking a slightly a sardonic look at situations that have caught our eye either in recent moments in our own personal lives or um, over the last few months. So uh, as always, trying to bring a little bit of humor into this. Um, but you used a couple of phrases that I think are worth bearing uh, some sort of scrutiny. The first is the uh, phrase of microaggression. And then the second one is that the victim is always right. So maybe you can break these down or unpack them for us a little bit more, bro, because I feel that they're quite important things to understand. And again, well, you know, we're going to be as careful as we can be on this topic, but we're just looking at these phrases and trying to understand what do they really mean? Yeah, uh, it is difficult. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm having to be very, very careful about this because there are certain sub issues that I'm, you know, that I shouldn't really refer course, to. Um, but, uh, yeah. but, you know, as I understand, uh, the, the phrase microaggressions come, came out of, you um, um, critical race theory in 1970 actually it was a guy called Chester T Pierce who first coined the expression Mm -hmm. to refer to the ways people talk to each other but the ways in in particular that white people talk to black people uh in terms of you know um not quite subtle but not obvious um uh prejudicial kind of language like oh it's almost like uh, if you ask a black person where do they come from uh, and and it's kind of, do you know what I mean? It's like um, uh, referring to the fact that that they're not white, yeah. they're not you know, yeah. it's that kind of thing. And it's quite subtle. Mm. Um, but uh, there's been a lot written and said over it over the last fifty three years now. So I, I've delved into some of that, and and it's not just racial; it's also LBG, LBGTQ. Of course, um, all of that. I don't know whether I get those uh, letters in the right, the right. There's more and more letters as each uh, year goes on, and so it can get a little confusing. Yeah, you have to be careful. Eight and Z. Yeah. If you identify uh, somewhere between uh, eight and Z, then we've got you. <laughs> yeah, but that's a microaggression, David. You oh, see, sorry, bro. I'm falling into that trap. <laughs> you've, already, you've, sorry, already, you've already ditched yourself. It might be to be as inclusive as possible. Somehow, I, I've already ostracised myself. You've from ostracised yourself, day. yes, because, because apart from anything else, you're completely not. Uh, you're not uh, qualified to speak about such oh, things. Oh, sorry, I, that was of your privilege. So you know, I, I, I'm, I'm do not want to sound like a right wing fascist here. Um, you know, I'm far from that, but. I do feel that some of this has got way out of hand and way out of proportion. Yeah. Um, so uh, what I see happening is it's being invoked in order to put people on the back foot, to keep them at a distance, to stop them from uh, interfering in policy process manipulations and so forth, agendas that other people have. Uh, uh, it's being st- it's being used to create doubt. Uh, to create doubt, for example, am I a racist? Am I a am I right. homophobic? Am I this person that I'm being told I am? Um, right. And when you start asking that question, you know that that is a breach of your defenses. That because yeah. okay, now yeah. you could say, and and many people will. Um, well, it's right that we should question ourselves. Maybe we do have these prejudices that are unacknowledged. And here's the thing: yes, 
I recognize that. I recognize that there's a sense in which all people brought up in a white, privileged British culture may have uh, overtones of um, racism because that's part of the culture that we've inherited. We should talk about that. We mm. should look at that. We should try everything we can to see things differently, to get into that sort of post-colonial mentality and, um, you know, and erase those tendencies. That is not going to be done by shaming each other. That is no. not going to be done by criminalizing each other. It's not going to be done by ostracizing each other. It's going to be done by what we just started out saying. It's going to be done by having a discussion, having a debate, uh, being able, each party being able to put their own perspective and not, you know, just hiving off into high dudgeon and, and um, you know, expressions of ac accusations, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be done by proper debate. Now, that's the, the in a way, it's the legacy of the academic, you know, because stuff, stuff, stuff that I've been engaging with um, is kind of university stuff. It's papers on the subject, you know, yeah. and um, very interesting papers, actually, some very, very good perspectives on it. Uh, and what I want in that situation in the situations, some of the situations that I've been involved is, is to sit down and actually have that discussion. But yeah. somehow, you know, you're not going to get it. And that's yeah. what really loves me. That's mm -hmm. what rubs me up the wrong way. Well, you know, thank you for saying all of that, bro. And I think these are really important points. And as always, you know, we're, we, we're, you know, brave enough sometimes to dive into these more difficult topics, because if we don't, then they just sort of perpetuate. And, you know, uh, debate, uh, like you, uh, I didn't go to a grammar school, but I, I did do a lot of debating at school uh, and surprisingly was was OK at it. <laughs> and well, you know, well, well. <laughs> I love a good I, lo I love a good back and forth and I love to have an exchange and it doesn't always have to turn into a place of name calling, which is what so often social media has done over the last couple of years, the whole trolling on Facebook and Twitter and all of these other kinds of things has, you know, has perpetuated this kind of um, yeah. uh, how to say this this space where we're not allowed to have a discussion and disagree about anything, because if somebody disagrees, therefore they must be wrong or somebody's got a truth that makes them right and the other person wrong. And somehow we've come to a place in society where people's egos are so brittle that they can't even enter into a debate for fear of perhaps being proven to be wrong uh, or, or even just being able to stand up for themselves. It's not about being right or wrong. It's about do you have conviction in your truth and do you have the integrity to back it up? Uh, rather than it just being something that you pulled off the internet 10 minutes beforehand or you heard from somebody else or is, you know, regurgitated information. What is your truth in this situation? And I like what you said about, you know, uh, the, the, the very sort of basic question, like, well, where are you from? You know, because you've got a different skin color from me, that somehow that I'm, I'm making an assumption that maybe you're not from these yeah. cold, uh, barren wastelands of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, you know, particularly in winter, Britain tends to feel a bit like that. Uh, and, and so how does that become uh, some sort of microaggressive racial comment rather than just a very friendly, hey, I can tell you're not from around here, but where are you from? Right. Which, you know, the, the question can be seen in two different ways. And a lot of it, I think, is about how it's received. But if the person you're asking that question to is running some deep wound or even programming that has an automated response, it's like, well, you're being racist by somehow alluding to the fact that I'm different to you, which yeah. is really absurd because there's, I don't know how many, eight, 8 billion people on the planet and we're all quite different from each other in many, many ways. Uh, and maybe that's what this Aquarian age is going to be about, is understanding that we can all be unique. We can all have different perspectives. It doesn't mean that somebody's right and somebody's wrong. You know, we've talked about this a lot before, right? The paradox of duality and how two truths can be true at the same time. Um, mm. But also, you know, we, we, well, myself and yourself and probably quite a few of our listeners have been brought up in a very... I would dare to say post-colonial uh, country like Britain, um, which until the seventies, colonial, yeah. Well, you can say it's still colonial, really. I guess. In many well, yeah, ways. exactly. Yeah, we want to get post-colonial. We want to. We want to bust. Right. Um, and perhaps you know, in terms of the the global. Um, presentation we do look like a, a sort of a post-colonial empire but the truth is that we still have a commonwealth we still have a monarch that was ruling yeah. over countries like australia and new zealand until recently it may still be we don't know what is the real situation anymore with the british royal family but yes we can say that back in the 70s britain was quite a, a racialist place so you know i studied irish history as part of my degree alongside politics at university and one of the things that we went into was this whole issue of how the irish had been uh, racially uh, prejudiced oh, against yeah. Totally. Uh, no, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. 
Exactly. Those were job posters put up in cafes in Britain in the yeah. 70s in London. And of course, you know, the whole uh, draft riots in New York were really between the people at the bottom of the pile, which were black and whites, uh, Afri black Africans and white Irish people fighting out uh, to not be bottom of the pile. Um, so, you know, uh, th these kinds of more, um, I had to say, very obvious racial situations against white people are often glossed over. And in the end, uh, it's, it's all division and subjugation. And, you know, what's been very cleverly done, I think, is to create this divide uh, by people like the British government. Of course, divide and conquer was part of British diplomacy for many years, and they're, they're probably still trying it, to be honest. Um, and so I think that this is where we, the people, have to start recognizing how we're being manipulated into these kind of situations where these kinds of narcissistic traits come to the fore. And rather than having a sort of a, a very gentle, open sort of back and forth, it's like, well, let's come to a place of conclusion. Uh, it, it becomes very aggressive very quickly. And you're you're calling me this and you're accusing me of that. And, and it's like, well, no, I'm not. I'm just asking you where you're from. Uh, how, how, sorry, I don't know how I managed to get well, into you know, a it, conversation. It, yeah, it's yeah, it's interesting with regard to that statement because you're quite right to say that it could be interpreted either way in right. much in many cases and I, this has actually cropped up in some of the discussions that i that i read is that in many cases the people who say things like that are like you look as though you've got a much more interesting background than i have so tell me about it you know um and it, it, but even that you know in some contexts is is not going to ring too well with people um anyway Right. Well, this, I mean, this is also, you know, on this tip, and it's, uh, I think this leads into the next section is about the spelling, right? It's, you know, the, the words that we use have a power and they have an energy behind them, which we can call magic in some cases, particularly with the English language. And how we, the people, have been consistently spelled. Now, we were talking before we jumped on this call, and I think you've got a few things you'd like to say about this too, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, I was talking about it in the context of medicine and healing. Uh, well, and I was talking that too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it came about because of a, a couple of um, stories that you made me aware of. I think one was a discussion of uh, a, a, it was sort of n of one case, but by by extension, it, it it could be rolled out to be an explanation for a lot of unexplained mortalities. Right. is that people have genetic faults and this one family for example where uh, very unfortunately a young man of 21 years old uh, collapsed with a uh, died with a heart attack and then it was it was found that actually in his family history a lot of other people had collapsed and died of heart attacks and uh so they brought out this 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 amazing insight which was that if people have hereditary defects um they might die um and you know i mean i'm looking at this as an iridologist actually and i don't know how many of our listeners know anything about this particular subject we've mentioned it a few times because it's one of the, the main strands that i use in in, in my practice and i'm mm. at the moment writing two books about it and um, one will be published um later this year the other one next year um and we recognize that a lot of the information that we read in the iris of the human eye is genetically determined whatever that word genetic means we'll accept it for now mm -hmm. um but we also recognize that coming from a, a natural healing perspective we also recognize that nothing in nature is flawed um i think the phrase mm -hmm. that came up in this um in in this particular discussion the the uh, the story that you sent me was there was a spelling mistake in the dna there are no spelling mistakes in DNA. DNA is the expression of an incarnating entity. It is part and parcel of who they are. It is not a mistake. And what we see in iridology, and this is what my second book is going to be about, is that when we see the mistakes, the symptoms the illnesses the pathologies if you like that, that we that, that we seek so earnestly to erase from our beings and never ever we should we should never ever suffer for any reason we should never feel pain for for any reason there should never be any inflammation if there weren't any inflammation nothing would ever heal you break your leg and it wouldn't heal inflammation is fundamental to healing right and um, so this idea that nature's got it wrong that there are genetic faults that there are you know i i get that there might be damaged dna as a result of assaults on us yeah. okay. totally get that but in ourselves and and by the way even that i think can be repaired we look at these things as lessons to be learned we look at we look at them as uh you know if you have say i, I do a big discussion on on the heart disease thing actually which is which goes something like you know you can you can look at a sign in the iris that says 
okay there's a there's a genetic weakness there that's coming through the family and and it's a heart weakness so you better watch your heart by the same token and we all know there's there's actually cogent uh standard medicine narratives that connect heart disease with loneliness isolation emotional um you know rigidity etc cetera, etc cetera. so we could also say uh that the sign is a sign that we need to look at our emotions and look at how we experience the heart as an energetic organ and whether we're connected with it or not because if we're not that's when it's going to kick in and you know maybe um malfunction big time so uh so this and, and what i'm trying to say here is the language that's being used is also that stories like that generate fear what have I got in my genes that might go wrong? It's like women having their breasts cut off because they've got the BRCA gene, you know? What have I got in my genes that might go wrong? they learning, again, undermining your faith in yourself, undermining your respect for yourself by telling you there's something wrong with you. All medicine tells you there is something wrong with you. You go, you don't go to a doctor to be told what's right with you. You go to be told what's wrong with you, okay? And then you get drugs that are very often called anti this and that, antivirals, antibacterials, antibiotics. Antibiotic means anti-life, um, antidepressants. Okay, so you get the anti word coming in. Yeah. And you're told you need this stuff because without it, all of this stuff is just going to engulf you and you're going to be sick and you're going to die. And that's why. And that's the major message that people take away from their encounter with medicine is I, I'm sick and I'm going to die. But if I'm lucky, some of this toxic shite that they're ramming down my throat might keep me alive a, a few months more right. and or, or even a few years more. But who cares? You know, as a natural healer, um, I have always chosen differently to that, and it won't be a surprise to many of my audience, you know, <laughs> you probably hear what I think of all that right now. But I am on a linguistic crusade here okay. to change the way people and as an iridologist, iridology is a linguistic. This is my big my big thesis. Iridology is a linguistic practice. We see a sign in the iris. We interpret it. We use language for that. Now, if you interpret a sign saying, right, well, you've got a defect in your heart that's going to scare the hell out of most people, right? And I've seen it do that. Um, but if you say, actually, you need to lighten up a bit. You need to do a little bit more of what you love. You yeah. need to open, open up to other people. You need to, you know, go socializing or whatever. If you put it in those terms, it immediately becomes a healing initiative rather than a medical initiative. Um, so, yeah, spelling. Uh, and, of course, the, the, the proximity of the word spell, as mm -hmm. in a spell mm -hmm. that you cast, words are spells no question about it and they determine our beliefs if we use a word uh mm -hmm. like i don't know let's take antidepressant it's one of my favorite this is what they refer to saint john's word as it's an antidepressant no it's not it's a healing herb it's not anti-anything do you yes. know what i mean uh, and we have to understand you know something like depression they used to call it melancholy and it was a preponderance of a certain type of energy in mm. the past you know mm -hmm. um so we we've got to we've got to revise our language generally and if we free ourselves from the linguistic constraints we suddenly open up other possibilities for healing and for everything else creativity you know, creating a new earth whatever Ah, ho, bro, for sure. Uh, I love this idea of the linguistic crusade. Maybe we're going to hashtag that one too. But um, yeah. so, so many things you just said there, which I just want to sort of pick up on because I think they're all important. So from a quantum perspective, the words we use are very, very important because they either enforce or reinforce a particular state of being or a belief system. And if you're being told that you're ill, you're going to believe that you're ill. And like you said, you don't go to the doctors to be told that you're feeling great. Uh, hopefully you've got friends and family that tell you that or that you look great. But, you know, so so what kind of healthcare system do we have that perpetuates the idea that, that, that you need uh, these kind of anti substances to to, you know, to make you better again? And invariably, they don't make you better. They just get you addicted to something something um so i think this is really really important but also this idea of of you know misspelled dna well you know for anyone who's been following the quantum plant healing website recently uh, myself and bella put out a whole workshop about quantum plant upgrades involving dna uh, repair work turns out that some of us myself included do do have uh, incoherent or corrupted dna strands uh, in my case, I was able to track that back to uh, extraterrestrial cousins uh, that uh, had given me at some point some corrupted DNA to work with. Thank you very much. Um, you know, so but at the same time, I've also willingly engaged with plants that have changed my DNA. M my decision consciously, I allowed ayahuasca to change my DNA. And most of all, I've allowed dandelion to change my DNA. Now, other people have also allowed their DNA to be changed, maybe without their uh, conscious awareness. 
And uh, maybe that's something we're going to get into a little bit later. The people who malfunction, uh, I think, is the phrase that we're recalling about that. But this idea of of somehow nature getting it wrong uh, and somehow uh, other systems, human intelligence or maybe uh, artificial intelligence, somehow getting it right or understanding better how the natural processes work, I think is A, incredibly arrogant and, and, and quite possibly uh, foolhardy in many ways. Um, and, you know, I'm just looking over the notes I made here. Uh, so, yeah, this, you know, in the story that I sent to you about uh, this particular condition, I seem to recall that it was put down initially as being some sort of family curse, because there was, I think, a death in the family every two years for 18 years. Well, anyone who works in the line of business that I work in, you see that kind of pattern of deaths. The first yeah. thing they're going to go looking for is a curse yeah. <laughs> because that's how they work. And I know that you've also dealt with this quite a bit too. And interestingly, our good old friend Nettle that we're going to be working with is a curse breaker, has a very, very long history in uh, magic and witchcraft as being a, a plant that can break hexes and curses. So I think this is all very, very interesting. And, you know, uh, in the story also somehow was trying to suggest that 30 million people are suffering from this curse condition yeah. that somehow uh, creates this misspelling of DNA that, that creates these heart conditions. Now, I, I don't know whether those 30 million people were in Britain or whether they were talking about America, but it's still a lot of people to suddenly come out and say, well, 30 million people are cursed with a heart condition that's genetic. <laughs> Yeah. Um, there's a lot in this, I think, that perhaps we can just leave our audience also to ponder on. Uh, the we word can, can't we? It's, it's a bit similar to, you know, do, do, you, do you make your bed a little bit too vigorously sometimes? <laughs> or they cause you to have a heart attack or, you know, gardening, the, you know, that sort of Pouring thing. Pouring yourself a glass of water. In fact, almost anything can become almost a hazard anything. occupation yeah, yeah. if you're not because paying attention. He about heaven you. forbid that you should start to think that there are any more rational explanation for right or possibly even non-physical um yeah well, situations yeah. which in my experience is pretty much always where the uh, the buck stops you know we go into the astral planes well, at least i do with my clearance i know you do too and um, we, we have a little bit of a look around there and we see what's in the person's terrain or their field that shouldn't be there that might be aggravating situations or what kind of traumas there are uh, and i would dare to suggest that it's you know, when we're talking, this is where things get kind of complicated too, when we're talking about genetic DNA material, because what I see from a quantum perspective and from an astral perspective is that, that we have blood ancestry that somehow plays an effect, but we also have soul ancestry that plays an effect. And I had a very interesting case just recently where a soul curse and an ancestral curse collided into the same time space continuum in the past, um, which is very interesting because blood curses, ancestral curses can only really work for seven generations forwards and backwards. And so there's a natural sort of 240 year time limit on ancestral curses. So I never find in uh, my clients fields anything on the left hand side of their field, which is uh, a this life or a blood family situation. Uh, going back as a curse or a piece of magic more than 240 years but occasionally I do find them on the right hand side of somebody's field which is you know sometimes a masculine wounding but more often not a past life or soul situation but very occasionally and I can speak from personal experience on this one sometimes soul and ancestral uh, lives collide and sometimes we have lives where we clash with members of our current blood family but we weren't in that family at that point and sometimes things get a little out of control and people end up cursing each other uh, so you know this is all very old paradigm stuff and i feel that this is all very much magic of the last two and a half thousand years that particularly got out of control uh, at various points in the last 500 years hence some of the the witch hunts uh, i certainly from my experience down in the amazon understood that shamanic psychic warfare or you know basic uh, cursing and witchcraft and black magic is endemic it's, it's pretty much going on every day all day from what i experienced uh, and it made me wonder well what you know did that happen in europe sometime like four or five hundred years ago and if so why and 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 who was really at the center of all of that and that's maybe conversation for another day but i feel it's interesting that all of these themes are all coming up now into the mix because as we have finished the last epoch the last yuga which i really feel for me personally happened on, on the winter solstice of last year but really came forth with the energy of imolk uh, just a couple of weeks ago i felt a huge shift out of the energies of the old paradigms. I felt a lot of the energetic shackles holding humanity back have now been pretty much removed. And it's really about where we put our attention. But with this sort of rise in the release of curses, it tells me that we need to resolve the unresolved karmic uh, pieces, not just from this lifetime, but from other parallel lifetimes too. So what do you make of all of that, bro? 
Uh, yeah, um, that's just set me off a, a completely different path of reflection, but it is a very <laughs> relevant one. Uh, you know, I, I love the idea of, um, you know, I've, I've been into the, the, the concept of um, parallel lifetimes, parallel timelines, uh, you know, my own parallel timelines. I'm using that idea at the moment to heal myself of a very... Yeah. Uh, a very debilitating family curse in inverted commas that um, mm -hmm. has come through, down through our lines. And it is, uh, again, people say, oh, it's genetic, you know, you can't do anything about it. Um, and I have invoked the idea of parallel timelines in my own, you know, in, in my own parallel timelines, my entity, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. And I have um, imported from healthier versions of myself um, mm -hmm. the cure for the problem that I have. And it's still a work in progress, but that's pretty much part of what I've been doing. The magic that I've been spinning for myself uh, is, 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 is very much along those lines. So um, I'm really, really down with that idea. I think that this is this is quantum healing. Absolutely. And this is the healing of the future. I'm looking forward to uh, a situation where a lot of what I now know and and to some extent that teach as well. Um, I think it's really valuable stuff. It's got us to a certain place, but there are some parts of um, our uh, our existence, our our reality that that even that approach, powerful though it is, is not going to touch. We need to lift it to the next level. The detoxification, for example, and I'm very much down with the idea that people need to detoxify their bodies, especially at moment uh, at the moment, mm -hmm. and especially yeah. using plants. The the only way, in my view, to do a detox is by using plants, and that's on a physical level really, really necessary. But once you've done that, you've also got to do it on the energetic level. You've got to do it on the um, yeah. on the astral. Um, you know, otherwise you 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 are still carrying around stuff that that will continue to make you sick um uh, and that i think is the the new paradigm that's coming in, in in healing but i think it's very much connected with with everything um and with the uh you know the new society the new earth whatever you want to call it that we're all trying to manifest um i think what you once said you know you can't get into new earth carrying all that rubbish around with you you, you just can't yeah. you won't be allowed in Lord, and that's the truth it. isn't it you, yeah. that is the truth you know we've got to deal with those aspects of ourselves and and um part of my work at the moment i guess I, i'm looking at people i'm looking at people who come to see me and i know for example uh, i i'm attracting i'm i'm pleased to say this actually the moment i'm attracting uh, i think quite a high level of clientele um and i say that not not out of any kind of boasting or anything but because I am increasingly these days working with people who are already on that page, who are earnestly engaged in healing themselves on those levels and are very, very aware of all the stuff that we've been talking about that's that's maybe getting in the way and making life difficult and making our family lives, our social lives, etc., difficult. We're working towards building a little bit of a tribe, maybe, Yes. Of, uh, of people who are not prepared to sit back and let the old ways um you know prevail anymore that i find very encouraging you know it's a, it's a small movement maybe but i think it is is definitely happening no i totally agree and of course you're part of the quantum plant healing tribe uh you know that we've set up uh, over the last six months and we're seeing uh, lots of really really cool people stepping up and sharing not only their gifts but also we're all resonating at similar frequencies and, and we have very open discussions on our live calls over at QPH um, which maybe I'll share a bit more about at the end but I just want to loop back to something that you said which I think is really interesting because it's also uh, been reflected to me by a number of colleagues and students uh, which is about uh, healing well in this case it came up to do with specifically to do with curses actually but curses that were suddenly appearing out of other timelines, past life timelines. And, you know, this is where our, our good old buddy, El Dandelero, uh, Dandelion comes to the fore again, not only with his, his genetic DNA changing skills, but also his ability to locate uh, in certain other timelines where uh, maybe we can say that the DNA got corrupted. How did it originally get corrupted or where did it misfire or misspell or whatever? Um, but if we are to take the position that, that well, if I take the position that, that the David that you're listening to right now is just an emanation of a much higher being who is also emanating across many other timelines, yeah. all simultaneously, all going on at once, all different aspects of that higher being, all living their lives, but all somehow uh, aware of each other, 
you know, I was, I was joking with Bella last night. It's like, well, you know, how, we've been talking about people time traveling from the future into this current time space continuum and trying to alter the course of what's going on here on planet Earth. But every time I do a timeline healing for somebody or I go and do a soul retrieval, then, of course, people in those timelines are also going to somehow perceive time travelers coming from the future into their timeline to do healing work and then disappearing again. Uh, so, you know, once we start to actually observe ourselves in this process, well, oh, my gosh, of course, people are time traveling into this reality that we're in right now, because we're doing it all the time in our healing work, too, whether it's for myself, whether it's for clients. Uh, I, I don't know how many times I've time traveled over the last three months, but it's a lot. Now, you know, it's not like watching, um, you know, a H.G. Wells time machine kind of a movie where there's a big contraption that I have in my bedroom that I jump in and disappear off, uh, you know, for several hours. And I, my inner vehicle is that is that machinery. Basically, my inner world is is where the time traveling happens. But it still is, you know, a very powerful. And, and you will know yourself in the way that you're working that when we start to be able to think in this much more fluid way where time is a very fluid experience we start to understand that every single thing that we do is important in all realities and so of course if we're going back into other seemingly past life timelines for ourselves and changing things there what may have been a traumatic lifetime for a series of reasons suddenly with the healing work no longer is and of course, that has the effect of coming forwards into this time space continuum, uh, hopefully in a positive way and manifesting into something uh, completely unexpected. And I think that when we start to think about this from a quantum perspective, we can start to understand that we can even uh, assist ourselves in past life timelines so that something manifests in this time space continuum is something that we need right now. Can you get your head around that? Yeah, I can very much so actually, and and I'm I'm totally totally on that page, and and I you know again just to pick up on that very very important point that um, time as we know it doesn't exist, uh, all our lives are simultaneous, and of course I yes. originally hooked up with that idea back in the 1970s when I first read the Seth books, right. which are immensely important from that point of view, and arguably you know that that, that sort of triggered a lot of. Uh, the subsequent um you know interest in these concepts uh, very very important concept this is not about past lives or future lives it's about other lives that we yeah. are or a part of us is now living um so that's why we can access them because they're there they're not done and dusted and disappeared and in a puff of smoke they're still there they're active they're vibrant and they're developing and they're evolving in their own ways and that's how that's the energy that we can contact, really. That's the energy that we have at our disposal. Now, going back to some of the other stuff that we were saying, I think the other thing about this is that, you know, part of the blanket curse that's been put over the whole lot of us to some reason, and some people would say it's a curse. Other people would say it's a reality system that we constructed for ourselves in order to have an experience and we chose it and now we're trying to divest ourselves of it. Uh, whichever mm -hmm. way you, you choose to see it, um, what it's done is to separate us from the knowledge of who we really are. Yeah. Now, a lot of people will be framing, framing that in terms of Gnosticism and the demiurge and how, you know, we're all living in a simulation and part of the, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of rules of the game, if you like, are, are that we have forgotten what it's all about. But I actually think, and this is another thing that I see coming, uh, is that people are going to start waking up to that knowledge quite quite soon. They're going to yeah. start realizing that they are not just this one physical body in the 3D. There's much, much more to them. I think that yeah. idea is very, very powerful and it's coming. Once we realize, for example, that we have other existences in other cultures, perhaps even with different color skins to the ones Ooh, that we've got Easy, now. bro. Careful, that might affect okay. some. But that busts the whole thing. All of oh, that microaggression that's... stuff, all yeah. of that woke stuff is out of the window. It cannot survive. Yeah. Right. It cannot survive that perspective. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. You know what, dude, that's really, really important. I like the fact you brought that up because, of course, you know, uh, I know from my own experience, that I've had many different colored skins across many different lives in many different parts of the world, uh, you know, and I'm completely comfortable with all of that because it's what makes me in this lifetime. But for some reason, this lifetime around, it was beneficial for my soul's journey to come in the form of the white skin with the British passport, blah, 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 and because somehow that's what my soul decided and every single person who's here on this planet, and I have to keep saying this many times over and over to people, everybody chose what they're going through. Everybody chose, there's no, there's no exceptions to that rule. All of us chose to be here at this time to go on the journeys that we needed to, to go on for the individual sense of evolution itself, but also as part of the collective journey. 
And, and you know, um, just coming back to this whole thing about the, the parallel timelines and curses and so on, you know, one of the interesting things that came out of the Moons and Mythos show that I did with Kelly Hunter this week was that Orcus, the Oathbreaker, is conjunct a full moon in Virgo. And when I think about uh, when I think about this, a, a, you know, a curse is a form of a soul contract. Uh, between two individuals or sometimes even more to engender a situation where something is learned about or something you know is shifted and, and I wouldn't say it's the best way of doing it but there is no right and no wrong it's just a learning experience and so it doesn't surprise me that as we move into this new earth timeline the so-called golden timeline that all of these past misdemeanors from everybody and I'm sure that we've all been cursed or cursed at some point. I don't. It's not particularly difficult to do, actually. Remember the three no. principles of magic? You call an idea to in mind, charge it with an emotion and send it. You can do that with sympathetic magic and you can do it with black magic. And it's easy yeah. to just even utter a curse by accident. So the, again, yeah. this is the, you know, the, the thoughtfulness and responsibility of the words we use. Again, bringing this idea of responsibility. But yeah, once we start to understand who we really are as soul beings, all of this BS stuff that we've been talking about at the beginning call completely goes out the window. It doesn't have a leg to stand on. Um, you know, yeah. and so what happens when we go off planet? Are we going to start to get cosmically racial towards each other? No, oh, you goddamn Palladians over there, man. You goddamn <laughs> Dracos, get the heck out of my face. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, you know, reptilianist against you. I'm going to be, you know, Anunnakiist against you or whatever the hell, you know, the latest phrases will be. So maybe we're just going to expand into the cosmic space with this BS, but hopefully not. We're going to realize that ultimately we are multidimensional beings having multidimensional experiences every second of every single day across multiple timelines to infinity and back this is where our good old friend steer karma comes in uh you know so, um, <laughs> to infinity and beyond to infinity yeah. and beyond sorry maybe he's gone to infinity and back because for those of, for, for those for those in the audience who may be new to this concept we do have a nickname for steer karma don't we it is buzz light year Yes, and, and, and there's more to just to do with the actual physical resemblance. And let's just leave it there. It is. It is nothing, no other. <laughs> apart from the fact that he's probably a bit plastic. <laughs> and then it's not because he's cosmic, uh, or at least if he is, he doesn't show any outward signs of it. So anyway, uh, we'll leave Mr. Uh, Mr. Karma uh, behind. And uh, let's uh, get into this, uh, you know, last uh, couple of pieces before we just talk about plants a bit more. But this idea of responsibility, both at the personal level for, for like what you just said, you know, right action, right words, right deeds, but also spiritual responsibility. And I want to bring in this because it's something that uh, Shirley, the artist and channel, Lemur and Dreamweaver, brought up about spiritual responsibility in our new earth visions and prayers. Are we being responsible when we make our new earth visions or are we, are we trying to call in too much too quickly? And when we when our visions and dreams and responsibilities come true, maybe they're either A, more than we expected or, or B, uh, you know, not quite what we expected. Do we then step up and own the um, and, and change or do we try to ditch our responsibilities? And I think this is really important because it's definitely something that's come up for me over the last few weeks with the the wonderful space that we're now in we have an energetic responsibility as guardians now of this place that we are now looking after not just to the the building and the grounds itself but as it turns out many other hundreds of beings live here with us including a, a wild cat uh, that's adopted us that was already here when we moved in uh, and, and so it's just like well you know as guardians of this space we have a spiritual responsibility at both the physical level to maintain it but also at the energetic spiritual level to make sure that the house is energetically happy and that the deva of the space is is flourishing and you know and vibrating in the right way so i just wanted to bring in this theme because responsibility is key in, in all um in all mm. things that we do but i i don't want to in any way start to think that because we're going to new earth that we're suddenly all going to be incredibly uh, amazing and that we don't have responsibility for anything so i think yeah, yeah one of my responses i'm just reminded of a, of a of a guy that um um we did some study with um a buddhist Lama Rinpoche, who happens to live in our city here, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, during during that period when we were actually studying with him, um, he was a very, very, very down to earth guy, and we were having a discussion in one of the pujas, I think, uh, in terms of you know what is spirituality, what is this thing we call spirituality, and I I did a sort of spoof on this on. Um, you know, our book um, fairly recently, which was, you know, I have I, I have a spiritual uh, practice. I get up in the morning, I do a bunch of stuff, 
I go to bed at night, I sleep a bit, I get up in the morning, I do a bunch of stuff. Uh, you know what I mean? That's spiritual. There's nothing not spiritual about living. Nothing right. is nothing yeah. is spiritual or not spiritual. It's all spiritual because it's all energy. You know, sure. there is no such thing as not being spiritual. Um, but the other, the, the sort of wider point there or the deeper point maybe is that I find that when I'm sort of dreaming in the new earth, and I, I, I struggle a bit with that phrase because I don't know how to do it. Uh, right. I, 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 I'm so sad to admit to you people, I do not know how to dream in the new earth, but I do at the same time. And it comes down to, what I was saying earlier about how do we work with people who are lost, if you like, do we stretch out our hand to help them out of the quagmire and get pulled in? Or do we actually just stand there and saying, this is how you could be just dissolve all that stuff. And you could be there too. And that for me is like, rather than sort of setting up scenarios, the real spiritual responsibility that I have is to be fully in my own power is to be myself in a way that doesn't harm anybody, why I don't want to do that. I have no interest in that. Right. But in a way that makes it very clear that I know who I am, mm. uh, I know my boundaries, and um, and I actually, you know, I actually genuinely do want the best for everybody. That's that's my definition of spiritual responsibility. Brilliant, bro. I absolutely love that because you, you're right, and uh, you know every single thing we do is spiritual, and and of course there is a tendency uh, in the wider spiritual community to think that spirituality is something we do on, on the weekend in a workshop, and then the rest of the week we're we're yeah. going to work, and I think that that's really really important, and you know uh, the biggest responsibility we have to ourselves right now is to be sovereign and in our integrity. Uh, to the, I, I would suggest that they're pretty much the exclusion of everything else and we shouldn't be worrying about other people's sovereignty and their integrity that's up to them to worry about and you know again I, I think back to my Amazonian teacher my Kichwa teacher who many years ago said you'll find yourself in a certain moment on the path David where you will look around and many of the people that you were walking with before are suddenly some way behind you and suddenly you'll look left and right and see a bunch of other people that you didn't really know so much before who are walking with you and he said my advice to you is to keep walking with the people walking with you and to to not drop back and endanger yourself in the process by helping people who are already falling way behind and have no intention of taking the path with you and i remember thinking to myself at the time wow that's kind of cold yeah um but the yeah, more yeah, that yeah. the last like sort of seven years has unfolded since that experience the more i sort of understand it and it's like yeah you know it's i want to help everybody i want everybody to be okay but if people don't want to help themselves that's not my responsibility. That's their responsibility. And again, my, my teacher said something also very interesting. He said, look, he said, I will never offer help to anybody. But if anybody asks me for help, I'll always give it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also really important because he said, you know, so many times in the world of healing, so many healers want to offer their healing to get people to help themselves. But actually, there's a resistance on the part of the person because they didn't initiate it. Whereas if it comes from deep within, shit, man, I really need help. I'm not in great shape. Can you help me, brother? Of course, bro, I'm going to help you. But if I'm this trying to a, push, yeah, yeah, yeah. push my healing on, it's a different story, particularly at the quantum perspective. We know that that doesn't work. So I love what you're saying there. And it's like, a, you know, and I would just want to emphasize to our audience, this is not a, you know, we're ditching everybody uh, kind of a response to things. This is just like us trying to make sense of what's most important. And this is where Nettle comes in with that sense of boundaries. I need to be boundaried enough to look after myself and say, hey, you know what? I don't think I want to go on that journey that you and several other billion people have gone on over the last couple of years. I don't feel it's right for me. And it should be my right to say, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, not because I'm going to go and hurt anybody with that. I'm not going to do anything with that information, but it's my right to stand up and say to people around me, no, I don't want to do that. Thank you. If you want to do it, fine. I'm not going to rub it in your face, all the reasons why you shouldn't do whatever it is you're going to do, but I don't want to do that. And I think this very nicely, bro, looks back to the beginning of the conversation where we're at, right? And that ability to be able to stand up for yourself, spiritually speaking, and say, no, I'm taking responsibility for myself in this moment. Absolutely. And as you're talking, I also remembered, um, you know, my my herbal guru, whom I never met, actually, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. John Christopher, um, mm -hmm. a very, very famous um, herbalist from America, who founded what he called the School of Natural Healing, which I think is a brilliant title for any school. Mm -hmm. And he said, don't come unless they call. In other <laughs> words, <laughs> he's not going to go around rescuing you. Well, you've got better things to do. But if you call, he'll be there. And, and I feel like that as well. Yeah, it's a very important message. So, you know, we, we've been talking as always.
Uh, on all of our shows a little bit about plans and today we've alluded to nettle and that's partly because we're going to be running a nettle immersion uh us and the team over at qph of which you're very much a part of and i i know that everybody who does those immersions gets a lot from the talks that we do at the sort of herbal quantum level of the plant and we've already alluded to a few little bits and pieces about nettle and you know even in this conversation i think it's very clear why this plant is able to deal with uh, boundaries to deal with karma but also to give that kind of warrior spirit is important right now but I just wanted for the last 10 minutes or so here just kind of do a little loop back through all of the emotions that we did over the last sort of six months of which you were part of all of them working first of all with dandelion then the artemisias elder yarrow and the you and angelica and just to kind of get a few of your own thoughts and what sort of came out of those processes for you bro mm. well it's always a pleasure to take the deep dive uh, with any plant yeah. And uh, these are plants, of course, that I, I became familiar with the first time around when we did um, um, uh, some training with yourself uh, back in the UK before you yeah. um, before you, you traveled. Um, and, uh, you know, what I said then was, you know, I know an awful lot about these plants on a certain level. Um, I come they come with baggage in a way, but I don't it, it baggage is the wrong word for it because it's it's always a, a, a pleasure and all of the, the knowledge that goes with and all the tradition that goes with herbal medicine uh, is something I'm uh, very much uh, involved with and and I'm passionate about. so uh, but when you actually enter into a space into a um, into an immersion with a plant, to some extent you have to go with a flow that, let some of that stuff maybe just float away a little bit or you have to see it in a different way and you have to let something else in and that's what's been happening to me in these immersions it's very much been a question of yeah i know this plant worked with it had my own ideas about it but let me see what else uh, the plant can show me and what's happening is that the more i do that and i sort of suspected this might happen um you know it's almost like cpd for me continuing professional development my oh. approach to using the plants because i work with plants every day with patients you know i match patients with plants that's what i do mm -hmm. um it, it it gains another dimension and uh, every time i do a piece of work with a plant I find myself working not just with myself, but with all the people who are working with me are getting the benefit of that. All the people who are working with me are getting the benefit of my new insights about dandelion, my new insights about the Artemisias, my new insights about elder and uh, um, uh, yarrow and uh, Angelica. Um, Angelica Archangelica is really coming strongly into my practice uh, um, of late as well. And I love that because... Um, I feel as though the the healing that I am involved in, I'm not going to say giving because I don't think it happens that way, but the healing that, that I'm involved in, let's just leave it, leave it with that, uh, is gaining in depth and meaning for the people who are coming to see me. And uh, I think that it is making a huge qualitative difference in the results that they're getting. So um, for me, uh, you know, one of the big, big uh, payoffs of this, and apart from anything that I myself might, you know, any any kind of insights or revelations that I might have, is that it's directly channeling through to uh, the people I work with and the way I want to work, which I think is absolutely brilliant. And I think, you know, anybody involved in healing uh, really could do the same. It's not difficult. Wow, thank you, bro. And uh, yeah, I mean, for sure, like, you know, I think I have quite a few uh, plants in, in my repertoire, maybe 40 or 50 plants that I know really well uh, from a quantum perspective. But I know that you have hundreds that you've learned, uh, maybe even more than that, uh, in all of your years of working with plants and to see now the sort of the quantum awareness of, of how to work. Because once you know how to work in a quantum way with one plant, you can pretty much roll the same kind of idea across all of the plants. Yeah. It's just a case of tuning into this, you know, the, the signatory frequency or the telephone numbers i like to call it of each individual plant and, and dialing them up for help and the more that we do that and like you you know um i've worked with some plants repeatedly over and over again mugwort i must have dieted with like 10 15 times now and plants like nettle even i've dieted with many times and each time i do the process either for myself or uh, a personal in the past you know it would have been a retreat over a weekend with other participants but now in the more sort of let's say the quantum cyberspace you know i, I i've been personally amazed at the the sort of the sacred energetic space that we've been able to create within the website at QPH to run these immersions. I never honestly believed that it was possible, but with the help of the plants and with the help of our excellent, uh, you know, um, uh, website manager, Josh, who's created a very, very solid inner 
you know, cyberspace for us to work in, we've been able to have these incredible discussions. And for sure, every, uh, every immersion uh, discussion that me and you had, I learned so much more and it, you know, just triggered more ideas about how to work with the plant at a quantum level. And then, you know, we're adding in the astrology and the Maya magic as well. And we're creating this very, very potent mix that I believe at the personal level can start to really unlock what our, you know, our old buddy, uh, remember weird Paul Strode calls the inner physician. And I really believe that as we activate these toroidal fields that we learned about our, our own self regenerating energetic system that we all have, it's present in every part of nature, the toroidal, toroidal field is with every house, with every landscape, with mother earth, the more that we understand that we are this boundaried, uh, self regenerating toroidal field, the more that we can start to view ourselves in a very, very different way. Uh, and I think, again, this loops back into many parts of the conversation about actually remembering who or what we really are. Uh, and the shocking thing might come for some people in the next couple of years is that they're not actually human, really, uh, in origin. There's something completely different. Uh, and that, you know, maybe that's something that some of us have already uh, had to deal with over the last 10, 20, 30 years, maybe with our journeys with Mother Ayahuasca or other medicines where with these kind of revelations have come to us. And so we're perhaps a bit more already, uh, you know, in a space where that's not so far out for us. But, you know, the, the immersions that we did last year came in a sequence it was very very clear from the plants but now into 2023 we have a plant like nettle that stepped forwards and you know um we, we've been talking a lot about the need to detoxify and i just did a nice piece with our friend rebecca o'reilly uh you know the food is medicine talking about the spring greens and rebecca's going to be with us again on the um the nettle immersion talking about the more nutritional uh food aspects of nettle but nettle i think is one of these plants again like dandelion that is really just stepping up to give us so much right now and you know most people have a dandelion story from their child but most people have a nettle story too i'm sure most of us can remember falling in a nettle patch somehow as a kid and maybe that's the only memory that most people have as a nettle but um can you just give us a couple of like top notes about nettle bro that you think could be really interesting for people at this time yeah, my top note about nettle is that uh, is the the partnership between detoxification and nourishment, yes. and that I find absolutely fascinating because uh, when I first started to study naturopathy, and that was God knows fifty years ago, so and now, um, the the, the two oh, pillars. Sorry, you're not that old, bro. If you're only in your forties, how does that work? <laughs> uh, well, it's time travel. Um, <laughs> um, but but you know, I was taught the two pillars on which the whole of sort of natural healing, nature cure, was built was cleanse and then rebuild, detoxify and then nourish. But actually, they happen together, and nettle does that. You know, it 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 activates liver and kidney processes. It's a it's a hell of a diuretic. You know, it really gets the kidneys cleared out. It clears out the acids from the, from the cells, from the tissues, from the blood. It gets rid of the acidic waste products really, really uh, effectively. But at the same time, it's just loaded, as Rebecca will tell you, with these you know humongous quantities of really important minerals. For example, iron, magnesium, calcium. Uh, you name it; it's all there in nettle, and um, that gives this plant a, a, almost like a, a double face, if you like. You know, it, it, it's doing both. It's doing two really, really important jobs all in one sometimes i say to people when they're detoxing we have a detox tea and nettle is one of the ingredients of it there are actually 17 herbs in it uh, wow. so it's, it's a very complex one and and i love it i mean it's a brilliant brilliant formula i think and, and all of those plants i i really love and some of the spices that you know that we're we've been more <laughs> familiar with in curries and things things like wow. fenugreek, cinnamon and and fennel and ginger but uh but sometimes i say to people especially i'm treating a lot of people ab abroad and i'm very very sus about sending uh herbs abroad now especially since brexit nobody in europe is receiving any packages and especially if they contain nefarious um uh, uh, you know herbal uh remedies anymore they they just get stuck in customs and then eventually the wreckage of them is returned to us if we're lucky if we're lucky but um but the but but i say to people okay so if the you know you you can do your liver detox which we do with a with a smoothie that involves um uh, a combination of lemon juice apple juice garlic olive oil and ginger uh mm. made into a smoothie and after you've done that you then have to sort of flush yourself through with all of this um you know liver cleansing kidney cleansing um detox tea and if i if they can't get a, a good detox tea i say just use nettle nettle will do everything for you um and i i yeah um i, I stand by that it's uh 
Yeah, I mean, nettle is, is a plant that I, very often, for example, uh, I, I do a lot of formula making for people, individualized formulae. Um, some of the people listening, I might have done it for them, so they'll know about this. Um, but when it comes to nettle, quite often I'll say, OK, we're not going to put it in the formula. Uh, it's almost like it's not it's too special for it, but you get a much better result if you just get some good quality organic nettles that have been properly harvested properly dried and then make yourself a, a really strong cup of nettle tea two or three times a day um that's really going to do it for you so quite often oh. I, it's a herb i give as simple i uh, know the the old um idea of simpling in herbal mm. medicine is that you give one remedy that can do everything a bit like our good old uh, dear elder mother, right? You know, the more that I yeah. think about everything that came out of the elder emotion, the more I'm just continually blown away by this being. But I, I say that about all the plants and yeah, yeah. the risk of, you know, yeah. upsetting any of them. They're all my favourites. And, uh, you know, um, I haven't been engaged with Nettle for a while. And uh, I was with some of my other uh, more mind expanding medicines the other night and I took some of my old nettle essence and immediately all of the thoughts and about everything else that were flying through my head all just dropped away and I was trying to, to think about something and that was like no it's not how we do things remember this is a place of equipoise and emptiness and you know for a, a plant that has so much fire you know and we're going to talk more about this on the immersion of course nettle has a deep link to meditation and ascended uh, Tibetan masters like Milarepa who, who yeah. meditated with it in yeah. the cave for 20 years but what you're saying is right and just as a final sort of thought around this Rebecca nicely alluded in the recent piece we did about the difference between trace minerals that we need that we find in things like metal as opposed to heavy metal toxification that we really don't want so again it's this kind of finding the balance of the sort of metals minerals that we do need and those that we don't want and you know nettle is a plant that's so rich in so many things not just for humans but for the garden as well and you know and it also tastes pretty good i have to say that wilted yeah. net uh, nettle you know with a nice poached egg and a muffin and some hollandaise sauce goes down a tree um yeah. you know and I, I know that rebecca wouldn't condone that particular meal but i i think it, it, it slips down quite delightfully to be honest and you know it's one of those plants that's up or uh, coming up right now and so you know as a final thought uh, we we do have this immersion starting march the first running with the blue hand uh, mayan a wave spell which is really about actually about meditation and about healing uh, which of course is perfect as always these wave spells are but also uh, just to let our audience know if you are interested in that immersion we have an early bird discount that's running for another two days expires at the end of 21st of february so do check that out and of course we do still have all of the emotions that myself and Pete uh, were participating and helping to run over the last six months. And we have a lot of people coming in and doing the dandelion immersion right now and understanding that dandelion is one of the, the uh, I had to say, one of the spiritual beings that is really trying to show us how to exist or just how to be in a more new earth, 5D, non-dualistic sense. And I think that you know, whilst we come to grips with the true nature of ourselves, all of these amazing plants are not only showing us how to heal ourselves, but they're showing us so many things, like apparently curses and parallel timelines that are just another aspect of me going through something. This is all the work of Dandelion. He showed me all of this, you know, uh, understanding that Nettle is a meditational warrior that probably has served in the spiritual warrior cast of maybe our, you know, our extraterrestrial ancestors, the Pleiadians, the Nibirans, the Draco, you know, this is a, a being that carries that very essence of spiritual warrior in it uh, to the extent where he can defend himself you know uh, that's one of the great things about nettle he builds these boundaries and gives us that opportunity to say no that's not for me and by the way get out of my space i didn't invite you in here and i think that this is a very very important part of the transition of humans becoming sovereign and understanding that when stuff comes into their space without permission that's called trespass it's called psychic trespass or even physical trespass and that we should all have the right to be able to say i'm sorry but that doesn't work for me can you please step away from me please step out of my space whatever that is physical energetic mental etc emotional and i think that maybe this is the real reason that you know as a sort of culmination of our talk today as we like to do to bring it back to this place maybe that's why nettle is again in our faces because to be honest, we weren't thinking about a nettle immersion up until about uh, 10 days ago when nettle very clearly said, no, it's going to be me right now. It's not horsetail. It's not fireweed. It's not ladies mantle. It's me. It's going to be nettle. And, you know, uh, I love the way that these processes unfold because the, the plants are talking to us. And, you know, I, I feel that, um, that this is a big part of the transition is this kind of understanding that we are much, much more than just the, uh, you know, the, the flesh and calcium that uh, makes up our spacesuit that we walk around in. The carbon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So uh, final thoughts for today, bro, before we wrap up, anything you wish to add to our discussion from today? 
Do you know, I think we've we've pretty much said it all. I mean, the, some of the themes that, that that have been coming out are old. Uh, we, we're revisiting, but I think we're developing them as well. Um, I'm, I'm getting a very, very strong um, feeling around the whole sovereignty, sover sovereignty boundary kind of um, uh, discussion at the moment. And I think Nettle fits that so beautifully. I'm really pleased that uh, that plant has inserted itself into our narrative and will be the next immersion. That should be a really special one. Well, they're all special, of course. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, um, come and join us, people. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and please do check out uh, more details on that over at quantumplanthealing.com. And, uh, you know, we didn't quite get to, to some of uh, the more comical pieces of the last couple of weeks. I know that we've all been having a lot of fun watching balloons drift over the world and wondering how, how these innocent little mm -hmm. uh, um, contraptions can seemingly defy all current modern world security services and systems, uh, which is really quite an amusing thing if you sit and think about it for 20 seconds or more. And, uh, you know, there are other more ominous things going on in our world that maybe we'll check in with in a couple of weeks, because I think by the time we get another two weeks down the road, there's going to be quite a few changes in the world. You know, the astrology coming down the road over the next six weeks is big. Big, big, big. And it can be big in a good way or it can be big in a more troublesome, challenging way. And again, this is really about where do we put our focus? So uh, just please remind our audience again, bro, about where they can uh, either get. I know that you've been having quite a few people coming to you now with uh, requests for medicines or even healing. So where can people get in touch with you if they feel like they yeah, might need um, The website is www.thenaturalcenter.com. <laughs> please remember the center is spelt with an R-E at the end. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the naturalcenter.com. Um, and there's a button there to press for inquiries. So if you want to get in, in touch with me, then that's the best way. Cool. And as always, a big thanks to you, bro, for checking in uh, this uh, Sunday morning uh, here in Mexico and, of course, being part of the immersions that we do. And just to say, you know, thank you to our audience. We love all the comments that uh, we get. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, the, the break was a little longer than I think either me or Pete would have um, really wanted, but uh, we're back in the flow again now and loving the new comments and the new uh, audience that's coming to us. And just to say again, at the end of all of this, everything that myself and the brother talk about here, we're just taking a sidelong look at things coming up in our world and trying to make sense to them as non-dual beings we have no judgment about any of this right bro absolutely yeah uh, no no blame no offense nothing else um just just two two brothers having fun hashtag just trying to make sense of it all hashtag uh wt boys are back in town yeah <laughs> exactly the boys are back in town so on that uh, on that nice note bro thank you again uh i'll be seeing you again probably in a couple of weeks and certainly uh, as part of the nettle immersion and hopefully going to see some of you wonderful people out there uh either on the nettle immersion or, or joining us at the qph group just to say we now have two two levels of membership we have a free basic members and we have a quantum members and you know even in the basic members group we do live calls once a month and we also have new content that comes out and most of all it's actually a growing space where many people are now meeting like-minded people and feeling free to talk about all of this kind of crazy stuff and more uh we, we definitely go a little far out i had a this is a final for i had a live call i did with somebody yesterday where i talked about et's wormwood and black goo all in the same sentence and one of the people listening on this live course is like oh my gosh you're the first person who's ever used all of those three things in the same <laughs> sentence i'm like well you should try checking out our group because this is the kind of conversation we have almost all the time so if you feel like wormwood black goo and uh, et's are something you're interested in by all means check us out at quantumplanthealing.com but if you're just interested in healing with plants please also check out either our website or contact the brother in britain to get medicine from him so uh, without further ado thank you bro thank you everybody and we'll see you all uh, next time around for another web of weird ciao for now